Again. Greetings, everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have a great trio of guests on a really exciting topic. And I'm really looking forward to a conversation. Uh, I think as long as the Future Trends Forum has been around, we've been using social media in different ways, both directly you know, to share information about our program and also to gather guests and to gather participants. But also we've had sessions about it. How do you use Twitter, for example, in uh, the academic world. Our guests here are going to join us to give us a kind of catch up on what's going on in this fall 2023, especially as the big social media site of Twitter seems to be, as they say, increasingly problematic. Some academics have been leaving it, some are staying. What goes into that decision? If someone leaves, where do they go? I'm actually delighted with our trio of guests who are three just wonderful people. And I'm gonna bring them up one by one and give them a chance to introduce themselves. I'm gonna do so in our customary Future Transform way. So let's begin with Karen Costa. Hello, Karen. Hi, everyone. Hi, I'm excited to be here. I uh, have no idea what happens after Twitter. Um, I quit last week, so that's why I'm here to figure that out. Well, that's what we'll all do together. <laughs> Karen, where are you today? Where have we found you? Um, so I live in Massachusetts. I'm about an hour west of Boston. I've been working in higher ed since 2001. Um, I teach online. Um, I do a lot of faculty development work. And yeah. I used to spend a lot of time on Twitter talking about higher ed and faculty development, trauma-aware <laughs> teaching, online learning, um, living as somebody with ADHD, late diagnosed, all of those things. Yeah. And um, and now I don't know uh, where I'm going to do that talking. So um, I'm going to find out. Well, let's, let's bash this out. Um, thank you, Karen. I'm so glad you can join us. Thanks, let's bring on, Let's bring on some more people because we also have my uh, colleague, co-conspirator, co-teacher, and uh, all kinds of things. Our, one of our dear Canadian friends, Lee Scalar Bisset. Hello, Lee. Lee, are you muted? Yes, you are muted. No. No, we still can't hear you. Okay. Well, you you fiddle with that for a second. I'll come. I'll I'll circle back to you. Let me bring up your other colleague, and this is a colleague who I'm, I'm, I have to say proves the rule that if you're going to be a guest on the Future Trends Forum, it really helps to have fantastic facial hair. Uh, let me welcome to the forum, Thomas J. Tobin. Hello, Tom. Hello, Brian. I'm grateful to be here with everybody today. Thank you. Now, where are you today? Are you in uh, Pennsylvania? Yes, that's right. I'm coming to you from my home office in State College, Pennsylvania. So I'm just down the street from Wesson, actually. Excellent. Excellent. We have a strong Northeastern vibe going on today. Uh, Tom, you know, the, the way we ask people to introduce themselves in the forum is to describe what they're going to be working on for the next year. And for you, as far as I can tell, that means writing 12 books, organizing 600 seminars, uh, and probably leading a small country to victory. Um, why don't you correct my, my vision here? Uh, the vision is correct. The numbers are just wrong. I'm actually going to be <laughs> writing... Uh, I'm going to be writing uh, two different books. One of them is called Universal Design for Learning at Scale. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful that uh, Greg Britton from John Hopkins University Press is on here because two of my co-authors and I are going to be sending him probably this week the proposal for a second edition of Evaluating Online Teaching called Evaluating Teaching in the Digital Era. So I'm really looking forward to that. As for leading countries, not so much, but uh, yeah, a lot of travel coming up and uh, I'm grateful to be working with lots of colleges and universities and keeping my ear in what comes next. Well, excellent. Uh, we're really, really glad to host you. And a uh, shout out to Greg Britton, <laughs> the hardest working scholarly publishing editor in the education business. Now, now, let's see if we can bring back Lee and uh, more importantly, see if we can hear her as well as see her. Uh, Lee, how are you doing? Uh, can you hear me now? Yay! Perfectly. Excellent. Perfectly. Not being able to hear me is rarely something that people complain about when it comes to me. Um, uh, I wasn't going to say it. No, I know. I'm surprised you can't hear me from the room of requirement. Um, 
we're, we're on the same floor in the same building uh, here at Georgetown University. So um, I am best known on social media as Ready Writing. Um, I have written extensively about using social media, about how I wouldn't have the job and career that I have without Twitter and social media. Um, and I've been, uh, uh, you know, just a really a proponent of using social media for uh, personal learning networks, uh, network learning. Um, I know most of you uh, here in the audience and recognize your names um, because of Twitter. Uh, yeah, largely Twitter and then bleeding over to other social media. And um, I'm really interested to in this question of what's next. Well, excellent, excellent. I'm really glad to see you. Um, and yes, by the way, Lee and I are about maybe 60 feet away from each other right now. Uh, we're separated by a beautiful uh, open um, atrium. Um, and so I'm, I'm really glad to see you. But here, let, let me arrange things so it looks a little bit, uh, a little bit more fun. Let me get everybody uh, up, up together like this. Um, friends, if you're new to the Future Transform, I'm going to ask our guests a couple of questions to get their thinking out in the air and to get things rolling. But then I'm going to try and get out of the way to make room for your questions and your comments. So as our guests start to uh, start to talk, please think about what you'd like to ask them. Uh, if you'd like to ask them to think about which platforms they recommend or practices or what's going on. Again, the form here is a bit like soil and green. It's made out of people. It's made out of all of you. And we'd love to hear your thoughts. So so to begin, I guess I, I want to ask, I, I don't want to put the question of what's what's wrong with Twitter. I'd like to ask outside of Twitter, where are you folks looking? Where are you playing? Where are you exploring? Where do, where do you think uh, academic Twitter might be headed? Are we talking threads, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Blue Sky? What, what do you think? Uh, not threads. Um, I'll start there. Uh, <laughs> um, and um, I'm on Blue Sky. I the reason one of the reasons I quit Twitter was I figured I should try out give Blue Sky um, more attention before I came on here to talk about what's next. And so it's it's your fault, Brian, um, that I quit Twitter. Um, so I gave Blue Sky a try last week, and what I found was you know, just going on and posting regularly, like, you know, this is an old school social media lesson, but for me, like reciprocity, you get out of it what you put into it. And I started to get out of it what I was putting into it. And uh, each morning I would have fewer engagements, on, far, far fewer engagements on Twitter than on Blue Sky. And that Twitter had been dying for me engagement wise for a long time. Um, and, you know, there was some really nice engagement and meeting new people and, you know, old friends on Blue Sky. Um, so I think I'm going to give that a shot and um, maybe put a little more energy into LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn is a little weird for me. I kind of feel like Big Bird at the business meeting um, meme on LinkedIn. But every, you know, everyone's very nice there. It's just not where I can be my fully weird self. Um, and I think I can be a little bit weirder um, on Blue Sky. So that's that's my current plan. Nice. Nice. Let's hear it for weirdness. Um, and, and just remember, before everyone else goes, you know, weird Twitter has long been a thing. Um, so how about you, Tom? What do you think? Uh, I'm struck by uh, something Chris Aldrich just mentioned in the chat. He says, all the platforms that Brian just mentioned are broadly corporately controlled. Haven't we learned our lessons in doing that? And it allows me to uh, post a little something in the chat from our good friend, Anna Cook, who is one of the designers at Microsoft now uh, in the accessibility space. And she says that the problem with any social media trying to replace Twitter is that none of them have tried to significantly change the fundamental issues with the platform. Uh, the recipe is too similar. And yes, some things have been changed, but it was an opportunity to do so much better and still could be. So mm. when I'm when I'm thinking about uh, Twitter, so for example, uh, my accounts, right? So I don't have an account on Threads, Counter, Diaspora, T2, Tumblr, Clubhouse, Discord, Reddit, TikTok, WT Social, Substack, Notes, or Spill. Um, but I do have an account on Mastodon where you know, 80 people are connected. I have an account on Blue Sky, which is rocketing up all the time. Instagram, which used to be my personal account. Facebook, which used to be just my personal account. Mm -hmm. LinkedIn, which was always just professional flu-flu-flu. 
and then Twitter and X. But the challenge is, for me, a lot of folks are heading over to Blue Sky because it is more like what Twitter used to be. And that that vibe of sort of weird blue sky is is getting there. So because it's an invitation only platform, the challenge is how do we scale that up quickly? Because right now, for me, Twitter is still the place where I'm connected to the greatest number of all of you. And so if if people are saying, you know, oh, Twitter is, you know, it's it's dying a slow death, it's gonna be a really slow death until and unless there's momentum somewhere else. Uh, this is a whole series of great, t great points. You've mentioned uh, features. You've mentioned corporate ownership or otherwise. Uh, you've mentioned the question of audience. Uh, and, and Karen, I, I want to make sure that you know, she mentioned one of the great lessons of social media as well as the blogosphere, which is to you know, keep engaging uh, and, and not treat it passively. Um, this is wonderful stuff. Lee, what, what do you have to add? Where are you thinking of heading? Well, I um, so in preparation for this, too, I have not yet left Twitter um, in part because all of the hockey writers that I follow that I have on a list are all still there and haven't migrated to other places. So if I want to get my Montreal Canadiens and NHL hockey news, then Twitter is still the best place where I have this curated list where everybody is. Um, I feel like this is what, like, it's, it's almost like a moment. This is like a small example, but when I don't know if people remember Grantland. Right. When Grantland was this great sports and pop culture website and they shut it down and all of the writers dispersed. Right. And so it was trying to recreate how can I get an RSS feed or a Twitter list of everyone who is at Grantland so I could keep connected with all these great writers that I had. Well, I, I spent so I spent the morning. Um, there is a, a plug in that you can get for uh, Chrome that will. Um, that will move through your contact list and try to find mm. those people on blue sky so mm. it's basically just scraping, um it's scraping the twitter list uh your twitter contact list and then connecting that uh through an api to blue sky trying to find the people who are there and of course i don't remember the name and i'll have to call it up on my browser uh, but it, it's limited capability sky bridge. It only goes sky bridge thank you um but it, it's it's limited availability. It's not that reliable. Like people that I knew who were on Blue Sky, who I follow, also followed on Twitter. It didn't pull up the right names or it didn't find anybody. But it also took me three hours um, because you have to. It only scrapes as far down as a screen, and then you have to refresh the screen. And when you follow over nine thousand people, that's a lot of refreshing and scrolling down the screen. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. so, you know, so I'm, I'm rebuilding. Um, I think that uh, my weirdness, my Twitter weirdness will probably move over to blue sky. Um, but, you know, you were asking before why people changed and, um, you know, it, it's not just the invitations, right, to get it scaled up quickly. It's the amount of labor involved in rebuilding something that made that in my case is, was 12 years in the making. Yes. Um, and for disability communities, for um, more other marginalized communities, what they don't have is time. And so we can complain about the, the data practices and the Nazis and Elon Musk all we want. But if this is the place that is easiest, that takes the least amount of time and effort and spoons, um, until it's gone, I know that a lot of these communities are staying there for the sole reason of, of just the sheer amount of time that they have invested in their networks and the sheer amount of time that they would that over a long period of time saying, well, now I'd have to do this in a really short period of time. And I just, I don't have the, that energy, the capacity, the oh. bandwidth oh. Um, where I know I can still come to Twitter and easily find my people and find my tribe. Um, so that's a lot of the, the sort of counter narrative to it's it's a bit of a privilege to be able to pick up and move to a different platform um which mm. i think a lot of us around here do have but you know it, it 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 still took me a lot of time right and it's still not rebuilt and on the other hand i saw a lot of well as i was scrolling through because it kind of makes you scroll through and there's something about reflecting on your social media network that it is a moment of reflection it is a moment to say, do I still need to be following all those people? Do I still want all these people following me? What was I doing with 10,000 followers? Um, 
you know, so it's it's sort of this chance to to also reflect and review um, what it is that today in 2023 am I trying to accomplish on a platform like Blue Sky versus what I was trying to accomplish in uh, 2010. Right. 13 years later, we are all not the same people using social media in the same ways. Um, and so then it becomes True. a moment to say, well, what am I using it for in 2023 and why, what am I looking for from it? Well, this is a first of all, thank you, Lee. Uh, you, you touched on also so many good things, both uh, you and Karen are giving us another great social media practice, which is uh, what Howard Rangold refers to as pruning or gardening uh, social media to go over and say, you know, why am I following these people and what am I getting out of this? Um, and uh, also, I just want to make sure that you, you had Canada represented here very nicely. Thank you. Brian, you. can I, um, there's something I'm just dying to say, um, is that yeah. one of the, the things that's come up to for me to this question of what are you going to do after Twitter yes. is to go offline a bit more. Um, mm. So I, I don't know if, and I'm, somebody in the chat, you know, was talking about that, but I'm seeing a lot of people say, I'm, sim I'm not going to replace it. Um, I, yeah. I think a lot of people in this space, if you're like me, um, for, for many years prior to the current owner on Twitter, I was actively debating if I was going to quit because I felt like it was taking too much of my time. I was really conflicted about it. Um, it, felt, it felt like an addiction at times. Um, and it was also for, you know, as somebody with a disability and ADHD, Twitter was also a lifeline. So it was very much, um, and it is for many marginalized folks. It was very much a both and. But somebody in the chat said, what are you going to do if you're not, how are you going to connect with people if you're not on Twitter? I'm taking a pottery class it, at a craft center at the, you know, local city craft center. Um, I'm getting out and seeing friends more. I text people. Um, I call people, I email people. You, the three of you all have my email. A lot of you in the chat have my email. I'm surviving. So um, I, you know, the, I don't really want to replace it. Um, I'm hope I'm kind of grateful to the current owner for, you know, driving me away. Finally, it's probably for the best in the long run. And I, I think we all, oh. you know, if I may bring up climate action, something near and dear to your heart, um, maybe a Please. little less time online and a little more time in the natural world um, could do us some good. Karen, I'm so glad you said this. I was really hoping we get to that point. Um, so, you know, one way of thinking about this is as a, a substitution, you know, so instead of Twitter, we're going to be using Instagram or whatever. But instead of a substitution, we have a reduction or a transformation. So taking those hours every day or every week uh, on Twitter and then putting them into something offline. Uh, I would love to hear uh, what people think about this uh, in the chat and questions. Bes speaking of which, something has come up uh, in the chat that's a brilliant question. Um, and I, I just lost the person who asked it. I want to say Danielle Lawrence. Um, when we're saying if a platform is good or useful, what do we mean by that? What's, what's, the, what's the goodness that we're looking for in a social media platform? I, I mean, I think it depends. Right. Like it's is um, I, I was looking when I first got on Twitter, I was looking to connect to people. I was looking to um, actually start a small business and, you know, it, it turned into that. That's not what I found, um, but I did find community. I found a new career. I found really interesting people. Um, I found out I had ADHD and so was perfectly wired for something like Twitter. Like there is there was a lot of things that I went into. And I think we all did when when Twitter and these social media started very naively, right? Let's see what this place is about. And it was initially like an, uh, a bunch of weirdos, right? And it, it's it's funny to me that so many of the people that I connected with early on in Twitter and as I went through and became very close with, with uh, on Twitter, all ended up being diagnosed as neurodivergent in one way or the other, almost all, all of them. And I don't think that that was particularly surprising given our personalities, given how we used Twitter, given all of these um, various uh, circumstances, even our age bracket, we were all Gen X as well. Like that's something that people tend to, to, to forget that, you know, Gen X made Twitter big. Um, it was mostly Gen X users. Um, 
Hmm. So, is, so now am I looking for the same thing in a social media platform? I'm looking to stay connected. I'm looking to, to keep learning, to keep bumping up. One of the things I loved about Twitter that I didn't know I needed was bumping up against so many different ideas and disciplines and experts in all kinds of different fields that I wouldn't have encountered otherwise. Um, I find just my LinkedIn network is helping a little bit with that. I find a lot of the professional articles, materials, research that people would use to share on Twitter on there. Um, but also, you know, a place to vent about when, you know, my mother's in town um, or, <laughs> or, you know, when I'm live tweeting, live tweeting or whatever it is, hockey games, you know, so it's, it's a lot of different things. And, and I think a lot of it now ends up being, distributed across networks where uh, you're getting certain things from certain networks, but it's not necessarily you're good. I don't think you're going to be able to get it all from one network the way we all got Twitter, if that makes if that makes sense. I think we're smarter now about it for better or worse. And that kind of that, Lee, as you're talking to the question of what's the value that we're looking for, it's kind of the three C's. It's it's community, it's creativity and it's crazy. And when we think about community, uh, I posted into the chat a quote from Robert Wolf, who ended up on Blue Sky a couple of months ago. And he said, I feel like this place is the summer cottage you thought you might visit a few times a year, only to end up living there full time when your house burns down. And that metaphor of Twitter as the house having burned down, the, the metaphor is of Twitter as home a place where you feel that you can be your authentic self. You don't have to mask for others. You don't have to put on the social niceties for others. You can just kind of let it all fly and let it go however it is. That sense of safety is what seems to be missing in the new iteration that is X. And that sense of you know, that, that you're not going to be persecuted or you're not going to have 17 bots come in on you uh, and, and start posting weird stuff on your on your uh, your feed. But then I go back to uh, my friend Raul Pacheco Vega, who's sticking it out on Twitter as well. And I'll probably be there as well until they turn the lights off. But he talks about why it's hard to shift. And he says that several things need to be said about social media for academics. He says, obviously, social media platforms are time consuming and you should be in the spaces where you want to be. To Karen's point about, you know, taking a pottery class or, or mm. investing your time where you feel it's valuable. But Raul goes on to say network effects and scalability remain powerful elements that will keep some or even many people on this platform and will not facilitate their migration. So if we think that way, I'd love to open the question up to all of you as well. How fast do we want to recreate what Lee just mentioned took us years to build? Mm. Uh, is that a reasonable mm. expectation? Mm. I'd love to hear your ideas in the chat or if you'd like to come on stage or use the, the question feature, we'd love to open up the conversation in that way. Thanks. Good question. Um, before folks uh, start barraging us with answers, uh, Karen, what, what would you like to add? What is, what do you, what is the goodness that you're looking for? Um, yeah, we've talked about this weird Twitter and and Twitter as a space for neurodivergent folks. Um, I I didn't real. I just started talking about having a diagnosis of of ADHD on Twitter without putting much thought into it. And um, then people were saying to me, you're so brave for speaking about having ADHD. And I was like, I did? Um, it just, it, it kind of happened organically. Um, that's a loss for me. Um, and it's certainly not something I'm talking about a lot on LinkedIn, a mm. little bit, but in a different yeah. context. Yeah. Um, and I'm kind of still looking for that space. So oh, I'm looking for a neurodivergent aff affirming space. And um, if anybody mm. wants to create one, um, I think there's an opportunity for that. Um, I will join and follow and promote it. Um, I, I, you know, I think Lee was talking about these, like, I, I forget the, the term you used, but like more focused spaces. Um, I, I, I'm seeing that as well. So you all know, I, 
I love Adrian Marie Brown's work, small is all. So I think maybe we're going to see smaller, more focused communities and a, a neurodivergent affirming space would be one that I would be eager to have. The other thing I'm missing about Twitter being off for a whole week um, is I realized Twitter was my professional Rolodex. So somebody asked me in the past for the, in the past two days, like for names, for recommendations, for this and for that. And I went, oh, sure, let me grab that. And I went to go to Twitter mm -hmm. that I would search mm -hmm. for my name and their name or my name and a key term. And that mm -hmm. is how, you know, one of the things I like to do in higher ed, one of my misfit roles is to connect people and to know who does this and know who does that and to make these kind of weird connections. And I was like completely at a loss, like, oh, my gosh, who do I recommend for this? So the good news is I, I, I kind of panicked for 30 seconds and then I was like, why don't you just think about it? And I did, and it kind of hurt my brain a little bit. And then I re remembered <laughs> who those people were and I Googled them and found them. And it took me like two extra minutes, but um, maybe those are parts of my brain that weren't getting used and now are. Mm. So um, yeah, I, you know, that that's one though that I'm missing a little bit, that sort of professional Rolodex where everybody is um, that I'm not finding in other spaces and the the weird neurodivergent affirming space. Um, those are losses mm -hmm. for me that that would be goodness perhaps in other places. And a, and a follow on to that sense of community, I'm noticing in the chat, people are posting their blue sky invitation codes. So people are feeling the community here, the sense of safety here. And to answer a quick question, no, you can't use a code more than once. So if you see one and it doesn't work, well, move down the list. Well, this forum is definitely a good space for this. Um, I, I, I have, see this oh, in please go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to talk about these safe spaces is that I, again, I talk about my kids all the time and it drives them nuts, but um, they are really huge discord users. And that is their safe space where there are neurodivergent ones, there are mental health ones, there are all kinds of discord. The way I describe discord, if you don't know what it is, is as if it is if the gamers got a hold of slack. Um, and, yeah. so, and that's exactly, I mean, it, the gamers did get a hold of Slack. It was developed for gamers to, to communicate, but you can set up closed Discord communities. Um, and, you know, you have, you can be a moderator, you can decide who a mod is, you can decide who um, is allowed in, you can set your own rules, um, you know, and, and it's been really fascinating to watch them negotiate these things. Mm -hmm. um, really empowering kinds of ways there's still all the drama that comes with being teenagers but like there's this really interesting dynamic but for me um i i i guess i guess the openness of twitter was something that was always really appealing to me where i get the importance of more closed spaces but at the same time like there was just this um anyone could find you on twitter and you could mm -hmm. find anyone mm -hmm. on Twitter. And there was just, and, and again, there's the hashtags where you would find people and, and connect. There's just mm -hmm. something about that. Um, I mean, it's still missing in blue sky because there's no hashtag. So it's really hard to like find like-minded people. I mean, that was the first thing they, they told you on Twitter, find, find your hashtag and you'd find it. And then you just go through and see and follow and, and you know, we'd follow you. And so, you know, I think there is something about that, that openness that, again, we were probably all way too naive about um, that, that I would miss on a place like Discord or in a place like Slack or even on this place by um, and it, even on Blue Sky. Uh, I wonder, so I wonder if we should have a, a special session on messaging apps, uh, WhatsApp um, and uh, Telegram and so. Uh, thank you, Lee. Thank you uh, for adding to that. Uh, let, let me throw the floor open to questions uh, because they're already come in and I want to make sure that all of you get a chance to ask and all of you get a chance to answer. Um, so this is, a, uh, this is a question that comes in from uh, uh, Karen Belnier. Uh, when it's appropriate, what functions or features do you feel will be most important for a new community space? So uh, if I may, Karen, I, I think in, in part, people have been answering what they, what they valued in, and still value in, uh, in uh, Twitter and other social spaces. But I'm curious if I can just twist this a little bit. What would you like to see that isn't already there? Uh, what would you like to see besides uh, um, no Elon Musk? <laughs> yes, I, um, one of the pros of leaving is 
trying to divest from billionaires, but as somebody was reminding us, uh, Jack owns Blue Sky. I don't, mm -hmm. I, yeah. So mm -hmm. um, it's really, it's hard to get away from, from the billionaires. Um, you know, it's hard to answer that because my brain is a little foggy on this because there's the Twitter of last week when I left and then there's the Twitter of six months ago. And um, so many of the accessibility features were being gutted um, over the past six months. So, um, you know, that that has that was a huge loss and continues to be a huge loss. Um, and I don't know. I, I don't know um, that Blue Sky and LinkedIn have prioritized that as the pre current owner Twitter um, mm. folks mm. had. Um, but for me, uh, I'm always one who uh, and I think uh, I don't want to speak for Tom and Lee, but I, I sense they would agree with me that. We want to design from the margins and make sure that um, mm. inclusivity and accessibility for all. Um, watching, um, you know, Twitter had done some cool things with with alt text, and they had an accessibility team and that had been put in place right before um, the current owner took over, and that whole staff was fired, um, uh, or many of them, um, and that that was gutted. So. Um, that would be, you know, really important for me is to listen to the folks um, who are at the margins and making sure their needs are met and making sure accessibility is at the forefront. I know a lot of folks feel that Blue Sky is like I, the invite codes. Um, I'm sure there's a reason for that, but um, it doesn't, you know, really send a message of inclusivity. Um, so um, that's yeah. that's a problem. Quite the opposite. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Tom, Lee, did you want to add more to that? Absolutely. Uh, my my feature list, some of which exists in various places, but it's five things. Voice, choice, agency, safety, belonging. Mm. You, you, mm. You, you have to have a voice that you feel that other people respect. Mm -hmm. You have to have choice about where you go, who, with whom you interact. Mm -hmm. uh, safety. You have to feel that uh, you're not going to be attacked, uh, even when, and perhaps especially when you're in conversations where there's contention and disagreement. Agency, you have to feel like you can act for your own good and the good of the community that's around you. And a sense of belonging, you have to find your tribe and whatever weird there is, you can probably find a few of them. So voice choice, agency, safety, belonging. Thank you, that's a great slogan. That's a great idea. Thank you. And Lee, did you want to add? Yeah, mine's less catchy. Um, just uh, I shared this in the chat because I remember writing this and I said, when did I write this? Of course, it was seven years ago. So ages ago when the choice was made to change Twitter from just a straight timeline to an algorithmically mm. um, a curated timeline. So showing you what you want. And it's even worse now right? It, it's, it's really even worse now. I would love to just go back to most recent on top, scroll down to find stuff that's older. Um, but the other thing, and I, and I think this is something, and I don't know if it's a feature or if it's just something with, that we really have to keep in mind as we build for the next one, is that not only did it, Twitter become a lifeline for uh, communities to connect with one another. It became a lifeline for government and other important organizations to communicate important information mm -hmm. to us, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And, um, you know, entire government agencies, and I know people have studied this, have, you know, have um, units that are all about just making sure that the correct information and timely information goes out to the right people on social media at the time. Um, and you know, we, we just had the telephone test yesterday. So maybe this is a good time where all of our phones went off in the afternoon quite loudly. Um, and, you know, for for a little bit, though, um, you know, tw Twitter served that purpose. I mean, we yep. sort of saw news happen, got information faster. People who needed information got information faster, like what we're doing here and like sharing blue sky codes. But it's like tweeting where people have electricity, tweeting where people are safe, tweeting where the waters have proceeded, tweeting yep. where um, how to get aid, mutual aid, how to, you know, that the, it became this really important public good 
right? And we can talk about, does this mean that it should be a government, you know, a, a public um, utility or anything like that? I think that becomes another question. Um, but but again, there there is some, there, there, that's why I say in all these features kind of collided in one space um, mm -hmm. to, to be able to do that. And I don't know if that could be replicated or if I said like, it's just, mm -hmm. things are just gonna get broken off and, and 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 live on different apps and live in different platforms and live in different digital spaces that are also and the one thing that'll connect them is our smartphone right like that'll they'll all live on our smartphone but in 27 different apps that may be it really may be um but thank you thank you for for uh, adding that as well um and a great question by the way uh thank you karen uh we have another question that follows along this line in a really specific way and maybe this is another request for a, uh, a Discord here, but this is our, our good friend, Steve Ehrman. Uh, and he asks, what I want is a social network composed almost entirely of academics who want to improve education. Participants should see relevant messages with a minimum of non-relevant messages. Avoid information flooding. What do you think? What do you think? I think, Stephen, be the change you wish to see in the world and that you should start that. And I will join it because I want that too. Well, me too. I tend to go where Steve goes. And I'd, in, I'd invite Stephen to come on over to Academic Blue Sky. Uh, one of the, the challenges with Mastodon was everyone could put a server up. And uh, our, our friend Josh Eiler put on, uh, was one of the founders of Sotol.Mastodon, standing for Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. And, uh, you know, six of us joined it. And it was meant to be exactly the thing that Stephen is referring to here. The organic community building that happens on a network platform seems to be happening over on Blue Sky, less because Blue Sky is itself a community of academics, but because of the, the echo chamber effect of I follow people with whom I'm already connected in other spaces, mm. and then they uh, get me to see other people who are doing the work. And this is actually one of the reasons why my experience of Twitter uh, up until very recently had not been that of seeing all the crazy because I was connected only and purposefully to academic colleagues. And uh, it, so, for example, I never would have run across Nicole Ellison at the University of Michigan. Uh, she studies uh, black social black social media spaces. Dana Boyd at Microsoft, who mm -hmm. is a, a big advocate for the accessible and disability advocacy community. Andre Brock over at the University of Iowa. Uh, 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 he studies uh, urban and hip hop communities or Meredith Clark at Northeastern or Chris Gilliard, a friend of the mm -hmm. forum at uh, Maycomb Community College, uh, doing his hyper visible about the surveillance culture of technology. And I, I was able to reach out to all of those folks through connections on the various social media that I've got. So to Stephen's point, um, most of the spaces where you go can be the thing you want if you are curating with an open mindset toward it. So, and I'm, I'm, mm. I'm saying mm. that badly. So Lee, save me on this one. <laughs> well, I, I think, I mean, it's, it's part of the, like, how do you, how do you like, again, over 12 years of Twitter, there is just a lot of happenstance that happens in terms of finding people, right? Like uh, the, the same thing. And if, you know, again, like you said, well, six of us joined right, this space, and then became the six of us, and that kind of might be really useful. But it's, you know, then how do you, I love the noise of Twitter. I don't want a quiet space where all anybody is talking about is making higher education better, right? I do want that space, I want that conversation, and I wanna know about people's cats and dogs and breakfast and kids and commutes to work and all of that kind of stuff, because that's the thing that builds community, right? Those are the things. That get that you get to know that gets you invested that gets you see where people are. Um, I don't think it's noise and junk. I think you know when people are like, "Oh, Instagram is just people's breakfast pictures." So what? Right? That is part of their lives. It is part of their day. We are beyond just our professional selves. You know, I want that space where Chris Gilliard and I talk about surveillance, but also complain about how bad our two hockey teams are. Right? And um, 
or sure. you know when when and, and so like i i just i understand and i know and i'm a part of closed communities and closed spaces and i really like those but i want like i said i love the noise and i know it's not for everyone and i know twitter isn't for everyone either but i love the noise of twitter and that's the thing that i'm going to miss is that all of a sudden if everybody's only talking about their very narrow focus of their academic lives or their professional lives then like then we should just all be on linkedin yeah well said and, well, you know a, then we should just all go to linkedin these are very very different uh purposes i mean you want the uh, immersive city lee you know the, the you know, everything going on versus the the small group but i i, I don't i I don't want to react. I want to add another question to the mix here. Uh, and this is from uh, Chris Aldrich. And I was hoping you would ask this. Uh, what does the indie web or the older blogosphere need to have to become a more individually controlled space for this sort of communication? And it gives us a link to the indie web for education. And Chris, I'm going to try and put that in the chat as well. I don't know if I trust higher education to do any better a job with this than than the corporations or the government will. Um, and maybe that's just my cynical hat right now. But um, the institution of higher education has not shown itself to be inclusive uh, as, as institutions. Individuals, yes. As institutions, we are still exclusionary. We are still... Um, we still put up uh, uh, walls and fences and gates. Um, we are still uh, mired in surveillance capitalism. Um, we are mired in big ed tech. I, you know, I have, you know, I, I, I want, I want my institution to stay out of trying to run communities and social media. Like I just, it's, and so I think as individuals and as collectives, I think we can look to our professional organizations. I think we can look to our unions if we have those. Mm. Um, we can look to those those other spaces um, to, to be able to create something, uh, something different. Um, because again, I just, I do not trust our, uh, the administrators of any institution of higher education to have our best interests when it comes to, or the community's best interest when it comes to creating some sort of platform, um, digital platform. I, I'm loving what yeah, I hope. Really I'm good. loving what I hope is the yeah. irony in John Hollenbeck's comment. He says, we need an assistant vice provost of social media. What do you mean higher ed can't help? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's, that's John. That's definitely John. Yeah. <laughs> So no, this is something which educators uh, can't do well, Lee says. Uh, Karen, did you want to add to that? I, I just keep coming back to, you know, Lee was talking about it and um, Liz Gross is here um, and chatting about like this desire to have a space where we can be our whole selves. So we can talk about higher ed and um, the, that the Red Sox suck and how we feel about Taylor Swift and um, social activism. And I guess I'm kind of thinking like, isn't that like what <laughs> relationships are for? I, I don't know. Um, you know, like, um, so that's just, that's bubbling up for me. And that's something I think I did rely on Twitter for increasingly that's why i had that both and relationship with it like i started to be able to get those things on twitter and i put less time into investing in them um and you know this i i'm really torn about this because you all know i'm a, a huge advocate of online education and online spaces yeah. um but you know it really did have a negative impact on my mental health to i i had i think uh, you know i'm kind of waking up to like three and a half years into this pandemic, how isolated I had, be, you know, I was online and remote before the pandemic, how isolated mm -hmm. I had become and how much I relied on those interactions that I never needed to leave my house for. And like, I mm -hmm. forgot to leave my house y'all like, and finding those people who I can have those conversations with and connect with on different levels and be a, my whole self with um, has, has been a challenge, but, um, it's been improving my mental health. So um, that's that's coming up for me is I'm, I'm torn about like, do we how much do we want to invest in finding a new space or creating a new space um, when, you know, 
maybe we need to just go outside and, and take a walk with a friend. I don't know. I'm torn on this one. Well, speak, speaking of the, the touch grass idea, uh, Brian mentioned a question in the chat. Has anyone talked about Facebook? And that's, that's perhaps sort of my wrap up comment on this whole conversation is that in the before times, Facebook was for me a way to be in touch with the people with whom I was personally friends in real life or my family members. And it still has that thing. So if, if somebody from another college or university sent me a Facebook request, I would decline. And it was, it was a, ah, a separate ah. space just mm -hmm. for my own in real life connections. Mm -hmm. After the demise of Twitter, and especially during the pandemic, that went by the wayside. And now, if you send me a Facebook request, I'll gladly say, sure, let's connect. But that meant that something was missing or something had changed. And when we think about the spaces that we've got, I want to, I, I want to say two different things on, this, on different sides of a coin. The return to in-person conferences, symposia, events, like I'm going to Educause in Chicago next week, and I'm really looking forward to connecting with a whole bunch of folks. And that does me some good spiritually as well as professionally. It's just nice to be able to talk to somebody in person. At the same time, I'm also an advocate for continuing to do the virtual conferences and, and virtual access because there's folks who are immunocompromised or can't afford to go or for whatever other reasons of privilege or circumstance can't engage in those kinds of places. So I would always advocate for having a space where it's welcoming and it's accessible. So that's a, a your question about Facebook, Brian, takes me right down that path. No, well, thank you, thank you. And just, uh, I, I chucked this into the uh, chat a little while ago. I did some quick back of the envelope calculations um, and uh, Twitter, sorry, uh, Instagram and Facebook remain by far the hugest socials right now. People yeah. keep pronouncing Facebook dead and it's not happening. Uh, the second tier is uh, really Twitter and then the uh, avenues we've been talking about, Mastodon, Blue Sky, are, are, are in many ways far below. We, we do have a, a question um, that has come in from Heather Mangrum, and I, want, I think this is a terrific question, uh, and I want to make sure she got a chance to ask this. With confidence in higher education declining, is it not important for academics with fact-centered information to share, to stay, despite the toxicity? Where else can these voices have a loud enough microphone? Yeah, I'll, I'll put that up again because uh, that was uh, that's a rich question. I, I want to speak to I, I that. Mean, if, oh, go ahead, Lee. No, what I was going to say that it. I mean, if th this has been long been a debate on Twitter about should I stay or should I go in terms of of how safe somebody may or may not be. Right. We know that um, who you are, what you look like, how you present all of the, your gender, your gender identity, your disabilities, that all of that kind of stuff matters in terms of how your voice is received, whether or not you have a Ph.D. Or, or are affiliated in higher education. And I think that's even more true right now. Um, but I, the, the way I see is a lot of academics have started. Um, this is another space where people have moved. Uh, since Google Reader has died um, a long death long ago, but um, the, the Substack, right, newsletters, um, going back to an earlier connective technology, which is email, um, to be able that. And so it's more of an opt in, much like blogging was an opt out, but you still have that opportunity for communication, connection, those kinds of things. Um, but uh, but I, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I, you know, I don't even, I don't think I've, I don't think I've shared anything relevant in acad to academia on Twitter in six months. It's been on LinkedIn or on Facebook or, or elsewhere because I just find with the algorithm, I don't think it's reaching anyone. Um, yeah. So yeah. I just sort of. <laughs> I, I guess I, I understand that and I appreciate that. The. I guess the question is is not again, Heather. If I'm misunderstanding this, please let me know. Uh, I think is in question of individual choice so much as uh, communal responsibility. Um, you know, if if we step back from a place that we find to be some degree toxic, however we define toxic, that incredibly overused word, um, what is the responsibility of academics to wade in anyway, or do we cede ground? 
uh, through disinformation, misinformation, and so forth. Brian, I was going to share that early on um, when the new owner took over, my friend Sharla Berry uh, and I were kind of talking about this, and she pointed me to uh, Sarah Kenzior. Did I, I get that mm -hmm. name right? Thanks, Tom. Mm -hmm. um, I, I put Sarah's um, tweet on this in the chat. Um, and Sarah, uh, Charlotte pointed me to Sarah's quote, don't cede territory in an information war. And that was very powerful for me. And that was one of the reasons I stayed as long as I did. Lots mm -hmm. of folks were fleeing. Um, but I knew that, you know, for me in particular, the disabled community and the ADHD community were, were on Twitter. And mm -hmm. um, again, for many folks, that's a lifeline. And I felt like if I'm leaving, um, you know, where where does that community go? I'm a part of that community. I have some, you know, I have some resources and privilege to share. How can I support that community? Staying felt like the best way to do that for for a long time. Um, once I got a little more confident and settled on Blue Sky, and I saw there were people sort of transitioning over there, I felt better about making that decision as part of a marginalized community to say, okay, there is another space to go. Um, that has lots of its own problems as well. Um, no easy answers. And to, to Heather's point about uh, ceding territory or do we have an ethical obligation, we have to weigh uh, the fact that we can't be everywhere. We have to take care of ourselves before we can take care of others. And we have to recognize that being in these communities is already a privileged stance. I tick a lot of boxes for unexamined privileges, right? Cisgender, white, older, all the gray hair, you name it. And if I'm in a space and I'm able to have an influence on a conversation for a positive good, I have that ethical obligation also to create space for other voices. I want to welcome in people who are newer to the field. I want to welcome in people who have a, a variety of circumstances and viewpoints. At the same time, I'm not going to fight every battle. I'm, you know, every every person who's got a bone to pick and wants to disagree with me. Lee is absolutely right. Uh, if we're thinking about Substack or other publication venues, we've had these problems for decades. You know, I'm a public scholar and I posted something on Inside Higher Ed or in the Chronicle of Higher Education, or I wrote a letter to the editor of my hometown newspaper in 1986, and every crank in the Cincinnati area just wrote back to me, right? Mm. But what we've, what we've got now is we have communication channels where it's not just three people who are reading it, but you actually can have a wider conversation with a large number of people. And I think having those conversations, finding the place where you can actually contribute, you feel safe to do so. And if you have some privilege, go exercise it on behalf of other people who don't. So that that might be my, my rallying cry to everybody here on the session. And you've been doing it while we're holding this panel. I'm reading through the chat and I am absolutely proud and amazed at the community that's building here. Well, it is a terrific community. If I can be cynical for just two seconds about that question no. as well. No, you can't. Um, oh, oh, but Go, it's also take, funny. Take as many seconds um, as you need. It, 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 uh, to me, there's this there's a cynicism that bubbles up when I see that it's like, isn't this our responsibility to stay on these platforms for the greater good? When we were told when we first got onto these platforms by academia that we were wasting our time and what we oh, did yeah. didn't count for oh, anything. Yeah. Right. And so now we've come full circle where the work we have been doing is retroactively, I don't know if recognized is the right word, but maybe weaponized in order to, um, you know, burn us out even further. Right. Like we were, we, I, uh, I'll show you all the comments on my public scholarship on Inside Higher Ed and everything that told me I was wasting my time, um, that what I did didn't count that Twitter was like social media generally was a waste of time. And, you know, then to, to kind of turn around to a lot of these communities and say, you know, it's your responsibility to, <laughs> to keep the truth alive. You're kind of like, oh, really? Where were y'all when we were, when we were, you know, turning around on us and hitting all over what it is that we were doing on here? I know exactly um, where they but, were. Um, thank you. Yeah, I don't I, think that's, I don't think that's cynical at all. 
Um, but what I, what I do have to say that is truly dark is that we are almost out of time. Um, we, and I we do have, want to leave it on that note. That's the problem. Well, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm not going to let that happen. Um, what I wanted to ask you all, uh, as a final parting shot um, for each of you, if you could just say a sentence about where you think academic Twitter is going to end up in a year from now. So I'm going to give you all a chance to think about that. Um, and just say in one sentence, you know, where you think it's going to end up. Is it all, are we all going to follow Karen into pottery and offline? Um, are we going to uh, distribute ourselves across all kinds of different platforms, uh, as Lee described? Uh, or are we going to be very careful and come up with uh, curated individual small communities, as I think uh, Tom has described uh, off and on? So wh what do you think? And we'll do this in the order in which you arrived. Karen, what's your sentence for a year from now? What do you think? Uh, small is all. Okay. And who is the author that you cited for that? Oh, that's Adrienne Murray Brown. Thank you. Small Thank is you. all. Small is all. Very good. And uh, Tom, how about you? After a year, the network effects will mean it won't be academic Twitter. It'll be academic blue sky. Ah, that's a strong, clear vote. Thank you, sir. And Lee? I don't even think Twitter is going to last another year just generally <laughs> academic Twitter or otherwise. I mean, and, and if it is, it'll just be bots yelling at each other. So, um, you know, I, I I don't have a lot of hope for, for Twitter more generally or X as it's now called. Twitter's already dead, guys. It's X now. Um, so, okay. <laughs> so academic Twitter is gone. It's academic X. Okay. And I just, I... I don't see it. I don't see it lasting longer than a year. And if it does, it won't be much longer than that afterwards. It'll go. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you, Lee. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you, Karen. This has been terrific and very, very useful conversation. Uh, and thanks to everybody for uh, such tremendous activity in the chat. Uh, you know, I like to end this by uh, by pointing where you can follow me. And that's how I updated that follow here. Um, so here's where you can find me on Twitter, where I still am, along with Shindig. Here is uh, myself on Mastodon. There is my Threads handle, and there's my Blue Sky handle. So you can find me in all of those as I continue to explore them. Uh, and also, to follow Chris Aldrich's question, you can follow me on the Indie Web, my own blog, which I've been running for years, uh, right there. As someone who's an early adopter of social media, uh, back before the term was even coined, uh, I find this all historically fascinating and also personally very invigorating. But what I especially love is that we could do it in the social context of all of us together. Uh, thank you, everybody, for all these thoughts and ideas. If you'd like to go back into our previous sessions and take a look at uh, what we have been saying about this, just go to our archive, tinyurl.com slash ftfarchive, all the way back to 2016. Uh, if you'd like to look at what we're talking about coming up, just go to the, the forum's homepage and look for the uh, upcoming events. By the way, Educause next week in Chicago, next Wednesday, who would like to join us live and in person there? Please let me know. Um, also, if you would just like to, all of you, please take care of yourselves. Uh, it's wonderful to think together with you. It's wonderful to collaboratively future with all of you. Please, all of you, take care, be safe, and be well. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye. <laughs>